Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I think we're seeing the future in in many ways, um, including uh, uh, including the collapse of the economy <clears throat> and including uh, social unraveling on almost every level as we're seeing. Um, and one of the things that kind of cracks me up is I've been writing for decades about how this culture is insane. And then when the culture acts insane, then somehow I'm surprised every time. And <laughs> it's, I, I, I don't, I, I don't really understand I mean, it's like it's like the cat who pushes the thing off the table, and then looks surprised when the thing falls. And it's just, that's how I feel. That that. It, anyway, yeah, I I think that we are seeing. Um, yeah, it's extraordinary how fast things are unraveling. I, I, somebody somebody contacted me the other day and said that. Um, that somebody who works in hospice had told that person that the the when somebody is dying, the measure that you look at oftentimes is not how bad they are, but instead um, how quickly they're getting worse. And that is a better measure of how close death is. And they were saying that in the context not of an individual death, although that was the the primary thing. They were saying that in the context of how the social unraveling is is speeding up. Um, you know, I thought the uh, I thought Trump was I'm I'm sorry, I thought Bush was was crazy. And now we look back on the good old days. And I thought the Democrats, I thought Clinton was crazy. And the Democrats, you know, have done their own version of the the same insane actions and commentaries. It's, it's. I was just thinking the other day that I want to write a book. Um, I, I have a list of like five I've got to do already, but, but I want to write a book sometime about what happens to, uh, what happens socially and the sort of social manias that happen at the end of empire. And I, I dealt with that a little bit in culture and make believe talking about how, uh, when, when one's previous entitlement, uh, begins to disappear, disappear that one, uh, looks for scapegoats and, you and I both know that in many ways real wages have been falling since the 70s and there's uh, you know it's it's and, and this 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 is predictable but I want to write more about about this particular the sort of craziness that we get um, I want to discuss the French reign of terror um, any anyway right. that that if you if you look back when when economic times when, when times have grown have been economically difficult um, people uh, tend to scapegoat for example immigrants a lot more but one of the things I mean mainly in culture and make believe I was talking about the insanity of the right wing coming out during those times and the scapegoating on the right wing and I think I want to if I were to do it again I would discuss it more all across the political spectrum. Um, yeah. I don't know how that helps our current conversation, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot and would like to spend a year reading and thinking about. That uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, look, sir, I mean, Sergio and I are pretty social people. And since this thing has started with the pandemic, I mean, I have like increasingly wanted to just lock myself in my fucking apartment, not go anywhere, stay with my cat, talk to Sergio, interview people, do what I can for local activists and organizing efforts and uh, read and write. I mean, and listen to music. 
I mean, that's it. That's, that's all I've wanted to do for four months. I mean, my faith or hope in uh, people has went like steady like this and then just whew, like a fucking bobsled. I mean, it's like, because, you know, just trying to get people to do, you know, basic things like collective responsibility, um, you know, looking out for one another. It's like all of these things were touted at the beginning of the pandemic and all that's gone away like now there's people shooting each other at walmart because someone asked somebody to put a mask on like all those stories in italy of like people singing opera to each other across balconies and shit like all that's over with you know sergio's talking to his friend uh, who lives in rome and he's you know uh, mentioned to him all the different things that are happening in the south crime you know protests right-wing groups, anti-refugee groups. So there's the scapegoating at the end of empire. But then beyond that, um, yeah, the uh, what people are doing, I think, is quite wild. I mean, I think what shocked me is that people just went and drank for the last two months. I think that's what's <laughs> shocking to me, is that people just decided to get shit-faced drunk since Memorial Day weekend in the midst of a pandemic with this wannabe authoritarian tin pot dictator uh with the whole thing you know the police people in the streets um that's what surprised me but why did that surprise you because i'm stupid <laughs> no <laughs> because no, i'm an well, asshole hey, I, I don't and i always stupid, but... <laughs> because i'm an asshole and i like to think that people will just snap out of it but there's no snapping out of it it's like the protests it's like once again, I was reminded when I saw the protests, I was like, oh, this could be this thing. Knowing in the back of my mind, the infrastructure and the organizing doesn't exist to make it that thing. Um, so, yeah, it's like, why be surprised with something that you know? I mean, like you said, you've been writing about it for 40 years. and <laughs> You still surprise yourself sometimes, you know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for, for saying that because it's... Um, okay, I hope you take this the right way. Um, cause I mean, you know how much respect and affection I have for both you and Sergio. I mean, so that's, that's clear, right? Yeah. Okay. But I was, I was a little bit dreading this particular interview because, um, because if we start talking about the current politics, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm going to end up saying some things that are really unpopular on the left. And I'm sick of saying things that are unpopular on the left and sick of being canceled again and again. But I'm so I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, you know, there wasn't a necessary organization in place. Here's one of the things that has really bothered me about what's been going on for the past few months politically is that I one of the ways that my faith or my I, I guess I should say my lack of faith in humans has been yet again confirmed is I've known forever that the right lies and somehow I keep hoping that the left is not going to lie and that the left is going to you know, I made a post on Facebook that I saw that you liked the other day, and and one of the things, one of the, one of the little parts in it was that, um, I think it's imperative for one to address the atrocities committed by one's own side, as well as even more so than the atrocities committed by the other side, and one can use the atrocities on the other side to rally your own troops. And I think that that's perfectly legitimate, but I think that when one's own side does things that are that on the other side would be not acceptable i think we need to address those and think about them and tr and and try to make sure they don't happen again yeah. and i mean there are a bazillion examples i can talk about of this recently but i'll just say one of them one of them that the, i can say more if you want but but one of them that, that kind of blew me away is that a lot of this was supposed to be about how 
about police brutality and police murders. And in Chaz, one of the first things, and it was about getting rid of the police, which was something else we can talk about. And then one of the first things they did in Chaz was hand out very powerful weapons to people who were not trained. And, um, and I've seen videos of the aftermath of the Chaz security um, murdering a, a young black kid. And then I've seen videos of the aftermath of that where one person is saying to another, make sure to clean up your brass. And literally saying that. And I think that that should get as much press as as anything done by the other side. But that is not attended to. Or when it is attended to, it's excused. And it's all, it's all, it, it breaks my heart because, you know, one of the things when I wrote Endgame, one of the, one of the premises was that um, violence done by those higher on the hierarchy is nearly always invisible, or when it does happen, it's fully rationalized. And violence done by those lower on the hierarchy to those higher is is met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victims. I don't think that's quite accurate. I think what's more accurate is to say violence done by those we disagree with. No, violence done by those we yeah, violence done by those we agree with is invisible. And when it does happen, it's excused. And violence done by those we disagree with is met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victims. So it's not simply hierarchy. It's also whose ox is gored. I guess that's the thing that's really making me sad. One of the things that's making me sad about the current political protests is it's, it's just so clear that if it's your ox being gored, then... I don't give a shit. And if it's my ox being gored, then, oh my God, this was the best ox in the world. And I can't believe you did this horrible thing. And is this making sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, there's a lot of hypocrisy. I mean, and if you don't check your own, um, to, to ordinary people, if we're interested in getting more and more people involved with this, which is something I'm interested in, then, you know, one of the ways that I've been able to maintain some level of credibility with people that I know who are not like activists, organizers, et cetera, are, um, is because I, I just, I'll criticize everybody, you know, including myself. So it's like, Hey, you know, I fucked up here. I made a lot of mistakes over the years. In fact, one of the books I would like to write if I ever get around to actually, uh, having the time to do so is a book on just all of the fuck-ups I've made for 15 years of activism. Maybe at that point it's 20. I would like to do, like, 20 years of mistakes, and then just, like, each chapter is, like, a different year of mistakes and what I would do differently and, um, you know, hopefully to help people coming along who would read it and go, oh, okay, I could see how this would happen or I could see how I could fall into something like that. Um, I think that's a great idea. I love that idea. Yeah. Oh, good. And I, I think it would... I think it would be really helpful to I think it would be helpful for a few reasons. One of them is that it um it would help young activists to not make the same mistakes and or at least to make them three times instead of eight times. <laughs> and it would also help because I know for myself at least, I actually don't learn much from other people's mistakes. Um I generally learn by making the mistake myself and usually about 15 times or something. And the, the other reason I think that's really helpful is exactly what you said about credibility, that um, I'm just... I, I don't think it... Ha well, I was going to say, and you can tell me if this is wrong, I was going to say I don't think it helps to pretend... To pretend, for example, that protests are purely peaceful, it's, it doesn't help to say that protests are purely peaceful if they're also involving arson or if they're also involving... I, I think that one should say, well, this part was peaceful and this part wasn't, and acknowledge it. But then maybe I'm full of shit because 
it, when I and the, the problem, the place where I'm maybe full of shit is where I'm saying it's not helpful because because propaganda is all based on this and you know one of the things I think is really interesting is uh, I read a ton of books on the Nuremberg trials back in my 30s and one of the things that, that I found very interesting was that Goring okay when I say he's a buffoon I'm not meaning to imply that he didn't commit horrible things but Goring was pretty much considered a buffoon through much of the 30s and 40s, in part because he had a terrible wound from World War I and ended up becoming a morphine addict. And he, yes, he did terrible things. I'm not undercutting that. Um, he was also just, every, he was a laughing stock. And uh, one of the things that happened as he was in prison or in jail, I guess, awaiting trial is he got off the morphine. And a lot of the uh, prosecuting attorneys were actually quite impressed with his intelligence. And the reason I bring him up is because he wanted to use for his defense uh, the Dresden bombings, uh, the history of the UK and the United States and Russia um, waging aggressive war. So he wasn't trying to excuse the Holocaust He was tr- that I know of. He was trying to, they were, all, they were being tried for multiple things. The Holocaust was one of them, also waging aggressive war, war crimes, et cetera. Those are all things facing the death penalty for a lot of them. Like some people like Yodel, I don't think he was accused of anything having to do with the Holocaust, if I recollect. His was purely war crime, waging aggressive war. And the point is, Goring wanted to use that defense. And the prosecuting attorneys and the judges uh, disallowed him from using the defense of, you did this too, and if we would have won, you would have been put on trial just like I am. So this is all hypocrisy on your part. They disallowed it, and of course he's found guilty. And the reason I bring all this up is because I was saying, I'm not sure if it's true to say it doesn't work to ignore one's own atrocities because it's been working for a long time and it currently works. And if you're on the right wing, you're going to ignore the atrocities of the right. And if you're on the left wing, you're going to ignore the atrocities on the left. You know, hell, it worked in the Soviet Union. It works. It doesn't matter where. So, so I would love to hear what you think about me saying it doesn't work and then disagreeing with myself saying it doesn't work. Because where, you know, I think you and I both agree that we want to be, that we think it's best if you admit the mistakes and try to build a larger movement without lying too much, you know, lying with lying as little as, as, as one can, because of course we lie to ourselves all the time. Sure. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. Go ahead. Can you take this anywhere? Yeah, no, I think... The thing is, is, it's not working. I mean, so if you're on the left and you're and you're thinking to yourself, because you see a ton of people in the streets, because you're seeing uh, statues toppled, um, because you're setting stuff on fire, which this might be going off track, but I was just thinking today that I wanted to do a video on like organic explosions of these things happening and then just kind of like planning to go out and do it replicated every night, night after night, which seems not very strategic, seems a little disingenuous and uh, seems to be lacking a sort of a broader, more sophisticated vision of what you want. Because it would seem to me that after however many weeks of people, say, in Portland doing this, or even in Chicago, I mean, there was what was called a black and black, brown, indigenous solidarity rally at the Christopher Columbus statue in Chicago yesterday. There were maybe a couple thousand people who showed up to it. And yes, they were trying to take down the statue. And no, I could give a shit about taking down the statue one way or the other. You know, take it down. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, or not. I mean, I you know. But the point is that that turned into just people throwing stuff at the cops and fireworks, rocks, whatever else. Now, 
if the right had done something similar, say the right showed up to a Martin Luther King Jr. statue and they tried to pull it down. Obviously pro- less legitimate in our eyes, at least. Not in theirs. Maybe. They want to pull it down. Would the left... Would left-wing people ask for the state to crack down on them? And in what ways would they do so? What ways would they support that? And getting back to the point of like actually wanting to win, I mean, the difference that I can see, Derek, is that getting back to this organic explosion of anger and violence, I get it. I could see why. Like When this happened, Sergio and I were like, I can't believe it's taken this long. It's not surprising that these are young, uh, young kids, mostly black, white, you know, even uh, Hispanic, Latino, but like mostly young, pissed off, inner city. We're around these people on a on a small scale. Like we know friends, neighbors, you know, people we hang out with. Everybody's extremely angry. People can understand why someone would lose it after so much. Um, but this sort of like what happened in Chicago over the weekend, what's happening in Portland, like these nightly protests going to the federal building, replicating sort of the same scene of like battling it out with the cops and then taking pictures and all of the, this sort of like, I guess you would call it like performative acts of politics. Uh, If you had the thousands of people in Portland like that, it would seem to me the best thing to do would be to go door to door if you had an idea of what you wanted and that you would go door to door with those thousands of people and start either handing out at the very minimum hand out some propaganda literature that makes you, you know, maybe look in a more positive light to the people there or better yet, try and have a conversation with them, you know, at six or 10 feet or whatever the hell it is, socially distanced conversation. But like, yeah, like knock on their door, step back 10 feet and start talking with them. Try and bring them into the movement. I mean, battling it out with the cops night after night uh, isn't going to bring them into the movement. If they see you committing act of, acts of violence and you justify it, but then when the right commits acts of violence and you denounce it, you've lost more credibility with them. So either be up front and just say, hey, look, we're going to get into violent confrontations. The right does it. We're going to do it. And that's just the way it is. Or you're going to have to switch your tactics and, you know, practice serious nonviolent resistance. And I from and I know Gandhi's a piece of shit, but from his writings, you know, this idea of Satyagraha was uh, the, the discipline necessary for participating in those kinds of acts does not exist within our movements right now. Um, so, so anyway, that, that I, I, that's like a long winded, just rambling response to what you said. But anyway, no, I love it. And I, I, I completely agree with your saying with what you're saying. I want to, I want to, I want to come back to the effectiveness thing in a question in, in a moment. But before then, there actually is an example of, the same people who are really upset at people being arrested in Portland by the feds. Um, there's a, there's an example of exactly what you're talking about, which is Clive and Bundy and the right wingers taking mm-hmm. over the national wildlife refuge several years ago. And I was among the people who was screaming that they need, the feds need to go in and bust their asses, you know, mm-hmm. go in, Take them out. Well, I wasn't saying take them out like kill them, but right. go in and 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 arrest them. This is crazy. Why are you not arresting them? Right. And so many people on the left were the exact same way. It's like go in there. This is terrible. Why is why are the feds not doing anything? And many of those same people are now going. Oh my God, we live in a fascist state because the feds are are busting some people who are messing with federal property. Right. And it's that hypocrisy that. But, but then, you know, maybe, okay, I want to come back to effectiveness now and, and just, okay, I think we've talked about this before that, that I was really excited when Arab Spring started and like, yeah, it's going to be democracy all through the Middle East. And we quickly saw that the winners in Egypt, winners of the first round were, um, the Muslim Brotherhood, because they were better organized 
and had been organizing since the twenties at least. And they won the first round. And then the second round was won by the basically U S backed dictator because they're even more well organized than the Muslim brotherhood and have more backing. So we both know the difference between mobilizing and organizing about, you know, gathering a flash mob and sustained, organized, intelligent, strategic resistance. And having said that, though, I'm coming back to the effectiveness thing, that at, at, one po at what point do mobs, is it okay if I use that word? I mean, because that's kind of what we're talking about in many ways, because I mean, we're not talking about the organized discipline resistance, but it, it, if if one's goal is to make through through forms of mob, they would say resistance. Other people might say violence. Um, let's just let's just go value neutral and say mob action. Um, if if the zeitgeist is correct, even though I kind of hate that word because it's so trendy. Um, if the zeitgeist is correct, uh, will that itself not lead to the um, those and those the, the governors no longer being able to govern? And I, I'm not proposing this as a I, I'm not comfortable with this, but I'm simply asking, does it work? Can we look at history and find, I mean, Okay, how much do you know about, and I don't know much, how much do you actually know about the Russian Revolution? So, so Maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm, with I mean the, I'm with someone who knows a lot. <laughs> so well, so, Whenever so I have a question, okay. I just ask. <laughs> so if it's okay for him to speak, I mean, how much of the, I mean, the, the Bolshevik Revolution was successful. It's successful in seizing power. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about other problems with it, but how much of that was mob violence? How much of that was, of course, World War I was just over and, and that was a complete disaster for the, for the Russian Empire. Yeah. Um, but how, how much of that was mob violence and how much of that was organized, was more organized? And what was the relationship between the disorganized and organized resistance? Hmm. Or if, you, if you'd rather choose a different one, you know, we can talk about about the French Revolution or any others. I mean, how how if we talk about effectiveness, do you see what I'm trying to get at? Oh yeah. Well, they did have. I mean, in the French Revolution, though, I mean, there were you had portions of the military that were organized. I mean, when I look back, yes, there were mobs, but in all of these, in each of these scenarios, you had organized, disciplined units, whether they were militia type units um military units police units what's that yeah labor i mean you had labor unions that were no shit disciplined organized militant labor unions like so yes you had you had mo i mean that's why i think there's going to be a shelf life to this i do you know who brett weinstein is oh yeah i i like a lot of his stuff actually as much as i don't some whatever he thinks politically, I know he wants to find like some kind of like moderate liberal middle ground, and God bless his heart for that. But you know, he, I do think he makes a lot of really good. I mean, the shit that he went through at Evergreen is fucking insane. Um, and he's been sounding the alarm bells about some of this. Um, so there's people like him who are completely concerned that this is going to take over American life. Now, and I understand his point that this sort of cancel culture has infiltrated a lot of in institutions already, and it poses a danger in that way. I agree. But I think that they overestimate just how powerful... Sometimes I hear these folks either in the, on the center or in the, on the right talk about the left, and I'm like, man, I wish I was a part of the left that you guys think exists that was power, powerful enough to overthrow the state and implement this and this and all that, you know, it just doesn't exist. So I think, and I think you're already seeing the shelf life to this. It went from defund the police, which I thought was a good slogan that could win over ordinary people. And if you look at the Gallup polls, Derek, 
it went from like 50 something percent of Americans going, let's talk about this to within two more weeks of street skirmishes and all the rest down to like in the twenties and thirties. You had all the shootings in Chicago, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia. People started to see all these people getting shot across the States in major metropolitan areas. And all of a sudden people were like, wait a minute, you know, uh, Georgia called in the national guard for Atlanta because they had 70 something shootings over the course of five days. Chicago has been a mess here in Michigan city. We've had two, three shootings a week, the whole summer, you know, we're a town of 30,000 people. There's people getting murdered two, three times a week here. Um, So people got scared again. They said, well, wait a minute, you know, defund the police. What does this mean? I supported it because I thought it was a good way to talk about use sort of taking away power from the state in a way that doesn't just abolish it. So the idea that you were going to abolish the police, I always thought was, you know, pretty silly. But I do think the idea of like, you probably have seen some of these numbers, like in some of these cities that are just ravaged by poverty, like one fourth to one half of the fucking budget is the police budget. So you're going, okay, like if you want to solve the crime, you legalize, like we all know what the fuck to do. You legalize drugs, you get rid of the war on, uh, you get rid of the war on drugs. You know, you put education programs, social programs, whatever, whatever it is, provide people with the ability to make a living for themselves or just give them fucking money at this point. Um, whatever the the solutions could be. But, you know, so the, it made sense to me in that way. But the people who said that they wanted to abolish the police, and I wanted to ask you this anyway, so we kind of got around to it. I, it gets back to the organizing thing. If you don't have an alternative, and if you don't, if people don't feel confident enough and trust in that alternative, then, I, I mean, I think it's, it's very naive. Now I can imagine when, and the numbers came out, I think it was helpful for people to see like 95% of the calls to the police, the police actually don't show up to stop a crime. Like there's a bunch of stuff that I think it was helpful for people to see, particularly where we live in the industrial Midwest, where the police are kind of held up in a lot of white suburban rural areas, even in poorer areas, which makes no sense because poor whites are also, you know, ravaged by the police and, and police violence and all the rest, the war on drugs People, you know, have the Blue Lives Matter stickers on their trucks. People fly the flags in front of their homes right next to the American flag. Um, So, okay, you know, what what could you do and how could you develop something that people would feel confident enough in to replace the existing police? That's that takes a level of trust and bonds and organization just in your small community. I mean, don't think about like an entire city. Think about like your neighborhood, like, you know, think about your block or if you don't live on a block, like, you know, what what, I live on a block. Like I think of our block, Sergio's laughing. Like we had one neighbor uh, get in a fist fight with another neighbor over something that happened with their lawn this summer. We've got other neighbors who the cops are called. I don't know how many times a week they're over there. The other one, this, that it's like, Ooh, you know, I mean, I have a rough time. I mean, I'm friendly to all of them as best I can be, but it's like I, the levels of trust that you need for those kinds of things. I think um, the level of organization is beyond, which gets to organizing and all the rest. But anyway, I'll shut up. But that's, I mean, what do I think? That's, I think that that's kind of, uh, I thought the call right away to abolish the police was the kind of stuff that turns people off that people could wrap their minds around defund the police, but that you undercut yourself when you start doing stupid shit or when you start sounding like a hypocrite or when you are a hypocrite or when you switch to these kind of like, you know, symbolic actions like tearing down statues and stuff, which some single mom who's living on the West side of Chicago trying to go to three different fucking jobs and see where her kids are going to go to school this fall could give a fuck less about the statue, and if she did care, you would have thirty thousand people there instead of three thousand people. You know. Anyway, sorry for these long rambling responses. No, no, no. I'm so glad, um, and it's it's always wonderful to talk with you. And I I agree with most everything you ever say. And in this case, I guess I just want to say a few things that I know, and. One of them is that when I used to teach at a supermax prison, all my students thought that prison and police abolitionists were incredibly naive, and they had <laughs> very little respect for them. 
Yeah. Um, and they would say to me, I can't tell you how many students said this to me. If you want to abolish prisons, you're going to have to kill a lot of people. Yeah. Because, because, I mean, they, most of them acknowledged that they were in there for a reason. And, and yeah, it really, I never thought about drugs much before I taught at the prison, but I, I agree with you that so many of them were in there because of the war on drugs. And this, these were, these are murderers. This was not simple possession. Right. So right. they were in because they killed three people in a drug deal gone bad. Right. And so I was never politicized on the war on drugs until I taught there. And then I realized that it's been handled very poorly. So that's one thing. Um, the next thing also just have to say is that I thought a lot of the parents of my students should have been the ones in prison because there is a reason that prisoners hate pedophiles and child abusers <clears throat> and it's not abstract and they're not stupid and they understand I am in here for the rest of my life because I made some very bad choices. Why did they make those very bad choices? Because I was put out to prostitution by my grandfather when I was four years old. Because my grandfather beat the shit out of me every day. Yeah. And they were, so that's, that's why they hate pedophiles and, and child abusers is because they recognize that that's why they're in prison. Okay, that's another thing I wanted to say. Another thing I wanted to say is I interviewed Christian Parenti decades ago and he's written about police and is a critic of the police. And one of the things he talked about was how, um, again, prison abolitionists are oftentimes quite naive because people in very, very poor neighborhoods often want more police, not less. Because, as he said, the police are not even the most organized or most well-armed or most violent gang that they have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, when I was teaching at the prison, a lot of my students thought that I was like very, this is very cute, Derek, it's very naive. When I would say, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could get gangs, if we could politicize gangs so that, you know, they already have the organization, they've already got the discipline. I mean, you have not seen discipline until you've seen Mexican mafia people. And they would be out there at, you know, early in the morning doing their jumping jacks. I would hear, um, you know, the sound of clapping and chanting and it was them. And I also saw, they showed me a couple of pieces of paper that were like, I don't know, small pieces of paper. They had to write the entire Mexican mafia constitution or whatever on this tiny piece of paper. The handwriting is incredibly small and the point is they're incredibly disciplined. And I was like, yeah, if we could politicize them and we could politicize the, the bloods and the crips and the black liberation army or not the, not what it's called the black guerrilla family, I think it is. And that'd be great. You know, we could politicize them. It's an organized movement. And they're like, Derek, they're capitalists. They're interested in money and power. They don't give a shit about politics. You are so naive, Derek. Um, and so that was another thing I wanted to mention is that there are, there are very real concerns of very real people who are trying to live their lives. And I mean, there's the guy, I don't know anything about the guy a week or two ago in New York city, just having a picnic with his kid and his one year old son was shot in the stomach by, by gang people, presumably, um, and I mean, this, this is a real concern for a lot of people. Yeah. And I've heard that one of the things that a lot of, I don't know this cause I'm not in these neighborhoods, but one of the things I've heard is that a lot of really poor people want more street police. Like there used to be people. It has to do with the community question. They want a cop who is walking down the street and who says, Hey Fred, how you doing? Right. You know, are you doing okay today? Yeah. And who actually know the neighborhood. So that's another thing. And then another thing is that um, years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I knew somebody who was trying to organize for police abolition and was getting nowhere. And the reason they were getting nowhere is exactly what you said, that they said, look, if there was a community defense organization in place, 
sure, abolish the cops entirely. But in the meantime, who's going to protect grandma? And that was another thing that uh, the Christian Perenni said that, that was very striking to me. He said, most of what the cops do is try to make sure that meth addicts don't steal grandma's wedding ring and they get kittens out of trees. That's most of how they spend their time. The most important thing they do is maintaining the class structure by busting the heads of union strikers or something. That's their most important function. But if you just go day to day, most of what they do is really kind of, and I'm going to get hated for saying this, but most of how they spend their time is doing officer friendly stuff. You know, my mom, this place got robbed by my, my mom's house. I'm living in my mom's house now cause she died. And 10, 12 years ago got burglarized by a meth addict. And, um, of course, first thing we did is call 911 and the cops showed up. They treated us very nice. I actually caught the guy, which is really rare. Um, and, uh, you know, as they say, justice was served. Um, the guy was sent to prison. He got out like four years later. And then uh, uh, he was out for like six weeks and was caught. This time he'd burglarized some people out $100,000 worth of stuff in his car and several guns and got sent away again. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of what they don't understand is society needs to be protected from people like that. And, and how are you going to do it? And, you know, when they talk about abolishing the police, great. What you've done is you've gotten rid of that. Does that mean forensics departments? That means there's going to be no forensics done whatsoever now? I was, so was something I was going to mention was like detectives dealing with old crimes, murders, homicides, rapes, um, you know, yeah. What are you going to do? Do you not have a detective unit? What are you going to do when there's a school shooting? Are you and the, uh, your local political group going to get your tactical gear on and uh, start maneuvering into the school to take down someone with a fully automatic weapon? <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of shit that I just like, I hear it and I go, I, you know, part of me, Derek, when I'm really critical, I, I'm thinking the way that we're thinking right now, or actually just when I'm on a normal day, when I've... When I felt really, when I feel really good and I want to be positive, something I would say is that I think a lot of these cats are young. I mean, I'm talking very young. I've been to a lot of these protests over the last couple months, or at least a few. Um, I'm talking very young. Like the protests that we had in Michigan City, there were like 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds that made up maybe 40, 50% of the crowd. Now, I had some pretty wild ideas when I was 14, 15, 16, and 17. Um, the older activists and organizers are the ones that I'm very critical of. Now, the younger ones, I think, you know, you have to be critical of all of them, but like, because everybody, I think if you're going to get engaged, then, you know, you're engaged and you're responsible for your actions. And, you know, it's part of it is just cr being critical and, you know. But, yeah, the older ones who apologize for this kind of shit, who promote it, who flag wave. I mean, there was someone who I won't name um, who I'm involved in a project with who wrote an article about the chop zone, the Chaz zone that I just, I was like, like ended the article and was like, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm paraphrasing or not even paraphrasing. Maybe this is just how I read the article. It was just kind of like, at the end of the day, it was a decent experiment that made some mistakes. And it's like, what? <laughs> I mean, fucking how many shootings? They had four or five different shootings within 10 days. And then the last thing that caps it off on a, a site that was built because of the, to protest the murder of, of young uh, black people primarily, you kill a young black kid and then another one sent to the hospital. I mean, this like to me catastrophic failure. Like when I look at that through the eyes of trying to organize something, it's like, yeah, now explain this to the locals the next time you occupy something. Like, how long do you think they're going to cut you some slack before they say, you know what, why don't you move in before that shit happens, like what happened at the CHOP zone or the CHAD zone or whatever? That's how this shit works. I mean, you can imagine somebody going, hey, this is interesting. I get why they're pissed. Decent experiment here. They're kind of taking over things as long as the trash is maintained, as long as people can go in my shops and they're not scared or whatever. But that's not what it is. People see it, and then something this catastrophically bad happens, and then the next time something like this pops up, you know, what percentage of the people in Seattle are going to go, yeah, fuck, shut it down. 
you know, immediately. I, I completely agree with you. And I completely agree with you about the age too, that, that, um, you know, young people, and there is a reason that they don't generally, uh, send 14 year olds to prison for the rest of their lives. I mean, honestly, when I look back at childhood and teenage years, I'm surprised any of us survive because we're so, we do so many. Yeah. Oh, like a great example. This is just stupid. I thought it was kind of cool. A friend of mine convinced me to do this. I thought it was kind of cool to drive down a road at night uh, with as long as there's nobody coming and then turn off your headlights and see how far you can drive that way. Yeah. We used to like, do it. <laughs> why am I still alive? Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that's 100%. just insane. hundred percent. I mean, that. I'm glad to hear you did it too, because I thought I was the only person stupid enough to do oh, that. Oh no, no, I could tell you even dumber stories. My friend used to, he used to drive in the passenger seat. He would climb out of the passenger. We'd set the car on cruise control. He would climb out of the passenger seat onto the roof of the car while I climbed from the passenger seat to the driver's seat. He would climb from the roof back into the passenger seat. So then we'd be switching switching spots while we're driving down the down the highway, country roads. <laughs> Probably smoking joints while we did it. <laughs> okay, so, so yes, I don't blame the young people either. Uh, young people are full of energy and they're full of self righteousness, yeah. and that's all great. Yeah. Um, but there needs I, I do like you completely blame the elders for this. Yeah. Um. Okay, that was one thing. Uh, I agree with you on the the whole chess thing. I mean, for a while, if it was actually a country. It would have had by far the highest murder rate in the world. It would have dwarfed El Salvador. Right. And this is this is not. And if it were the right wing that took it over, and there were this many murders, and they said, "Oh, this was a mistake," you know, I mean, that we made some mistakes and we'll learn from them. Oh my God, the left would crucify them, rightly so. Right. And anyway, so we're in agreement on that. Um. And then you said something else in there. Uh, All predictable, by the way. I mean, it goes back to, like, totally. Pre <laughs> we have friends in Olympia, Washington, and in, in Seattle who we talk to who are like, you know, what do you guys think of this? And we're like, you know, we've talked about this in the past, so there's no need to kind of go over it again. But, yeah, I mean, I've told this story a million times. I'll say it again. Military Marine Corps boot camp is 13 weeks long. You don't touch a loaded weapon until, what, week 10, week 11? Yeah, week 11, you touch a loaded weapon. Then if you're in the infantry, you go to eight more weeks of training. And even then, you're shooting weapons maybe once a week. The rest of it is just like disciplinary physical fitness, like keeping people in line. You know? Um, well, that's an, okay, it's just totally that's predictable. A couple of things I want to... Go ahead, please. No, no, no. I was just going to say it's totally predictable in the level of training that's needed to properly <laughs> handle weapons. Like I told our friend who was up there trying to help them out to the extent that he could because he was a veteran. And his, his point was, these people are here. I live in this area. They're going to do this anyway. I'm an army ranger, a former army ranger. The least I could do is try and give them some tips so they don't fucking kill themselves. But, you know, it ended up happening anyway because you need 21 weeks of training to make sure. And even then, bad shit happens all the time. People still have negligent discharges. People still do stupid shit. Um, anyway. And I mean, even in the military, I mean, even with all that training, even with experience, um, there still is accidental friendly fire. Yep. And I mean, you're, so I used to go hunting with these guys. Um, they, they taught me how to shoot and then they taught me to, uh, to hunt. And it was always very interesting because first, um, the first thing he ever did before he handed me a gun is he used his hand to show me what crossing somebody with a gun is, mm -hmm. where you take the gun and you go across them as opposed to putting it to the ground. And he said, before he handed me the gun, he said, if you ever once, once cross me with a gun, I don't care if it's loaded or unloaded, I will never, ever go anywhere with you with a gun again. Yep. That's the first thing. Second thing is, when we would go hunting, I was just very inexperienced, and we would all be equal in the truck, and then we get out of the truck at the hunting place, and then I do what they say. They're in charge completely. They are absolute dictators. They say, Derek, 
we want you to walk over here. We want you to walk this fast. And we're going to be over here. We do not want you to point the gun to your left. And then I do what they say. At the end of the day, we get back in the truck. Then we're equals again. And there is this hierarchy. That's one thing I wanted to say. Another thing I wanted to say is, is yes, I mean, when, when, when things are real, you have to be disciplined. I remember getting into an argument with a guy at a talk one time. He was a young anarchist. And he was saying that, no, nobody can ever tell anybody else what to do. And I have to be free to do whatever I want at every moment. And I said, okay, let's pretend for a moment that I am that we're both in a real resistance movement. Say we're in in Russia, World War II, we're behind Nazi territory, and we are going to do an action. I say, if you say you're gonna show up for this action and you don't show up, and my friend dies because you didn't feel like showing up today, I'm gonna find you and kill you. I mean, that this is this if you kill my friend by you being too lazy to do it, right? Um so that's another thing. And then the third thing I really need to bring to this, to any discussion of, of abolishing police or any of the stuff that's going on, is these people need to read some Mumford because Mumford talks about how you have technologies don't exist in a vacuum and they lead to specific power structures and if you have a system that includes, for example, mining, you have to have a system that includes cops because you have and a military, because you have to get a way to force people into the mines. You have to get a way to protect the ore and to protect at every part of the process. It has to be protected because otherwise people are just going to take it. And we see this in failed states where you know, failed states, whatever. I mean, a, a state succeeding is failing in some ways. But anyway, in failed states where it's a really hard, it's really difficult to keep the uh, grid running because everybody steals the wire to recycle. And you, I'm not blaming the people individually. I'm just, I mean, oftentimes they're very, very poor. But my point is that if you want to have an electrical grid, somebody has to protect it. If you want to have a system of, of commerce like we have, you have to have somebody to enforce rules about that. Mm -hmm. And it demands – and the, the people at Chaz knew this because one of the first things they did was set up a military and right. set up a, right. a police system. So they're even lying to themselves on that. So the, the point is that – and another thing that just gets me in all this is is they they talk about how you know there are there have been cultures that existed without police, but it's like a first many of these are small small cultures like 120 people in a community where everybody knows each other and you can have relationships such that if somebody's doing something terrible, you can go say hey you're doing something terrible and you need to stop. And the other thing is that even those cultures had ways to deal with sociopaths. About 2.5% of people are born sociopaths. More are created through bad child rearing, etc. But some people are just born that way. And the Inuits would take the soci If somebody was shown to be a sociopath, they would take them out hunting and then they would push them off the ice flow. And um, if... And the... Dakota had rules against killing buffalo out of season. They had taboos against it that, that would hold in most cases. But if people did kill buffalo at the wrong time of year or kill a mother, you're not supposed to kill a buffalo mother because then that's where the reproduction comes from. Um, if somebody did that, then they would ban them, which is a, a social death and probably a death because you can't live by yourself. And I mean, there would be consequences. So a lot of times people will talk about how cultures didn't have police, but the truth is they still had consequences, which sometimes consisted of bashing somebody in the head right. and 
sometimes consist of other things. I, I, I know this is a far afield, but it's, it's very interesting to me. <clears throat> There's a website I go to sometimes called Executed the Day, which is whatever execution happened that day in history. And it's, it's, I learned a lot of history this way. Anyway, there was one day where there, it, I learned about this, this. This was in French colonial days in Louisiana, what is now Louisiana. And I don't remember the exact story, but basically some white people killed some Indians and the white people got arrested for doing so. And then the uh, French colonial government insisted that the justice, but that they were going to execute the, the men who killed the Indians. And there was a big fight between the whites and Indians because the Indians, in their tradition, in their culture, the one, the family of the murdered person was the one who executed the murderer. And in the colonial system, of course, the state has a monopoly on violence. So the state refused to hand over the people to be killed by the Indians and shot them themselves. So it doesn't matter. I mean, the guys, the murderers ended up dead. And my point is that the the Indians did not object to the death penalty in that particular case. They objected to the fact that they didn't get to kill them. And in fact, they then killed a bunch of whites um, in retaliation for not being able to do their own form of justice. And it ended up being this big mess where there's retaliation on both sides. And I just thought it was really interesting because A, the implication is that and we're always sort of told they had no system of justice or the system of justice was, and we always hear about this one group in Africa, I don't know if it really exists, where if somebody does something bad, then everybody in society says good things about them until they feel better about themselves. Hmm. But we never hear about these other cases where, you know, in this case, or, you know, with, with go back to the Vikings. And if somebody killed somebody else, then either they would die or they would pay vergel, They would pay a fine. I mean, there are... We, the point is, we need to have ways to deal with this within our society. We need to have ways to deal with sociopaths or in modern days, meth addicts or, you know, whatever. Um, I was just talking to a guy a couple of days ago who uh, lives not very far from me. The meth addicts are always just breaking into his house and stealing stuff. And, and it doesn't help us to pretend that none of this takes place. Well, no, none of these people live in, I don't know where these people live. I mean, Sergio and I talk about that. I'm a hit to just jump in, but I like there's, it brings me all the way back to your experiences in the prison. There's a lot of fucking people on the left who are in these circles or in these institutions who've spent no time in the streets. I don't know where they live. I don't know where they've grown up, but around here, I'll give you a good story. When we had the rally in Michigan city, the gentleman who owns the store next door to the community center where we're sitting in right now, he uh, he's like 40-something-year-old black dude, um, good guy. We've hung out with him. You know, we hang out with him regularly when we've seen him over the years, and we've had joint events and all the rest. During the day of the protest, he was like, his cousin Reggie was out there with a bullhorn, but before we saw all this, before we got to the protest, he just let us know. He was like, hey, Vince, Sergio, he's like, I'm going to be here with my gun. He's like, y'all, good luck tonight. He's like, yeah, he was just like, y'all have good luck. Like, I totally support the rally, but I also know there's some goofy motherfuckers out there, man. He's like, there might be 5% of that crowd that's just looking to do some wild shit tonight, and they ain't going to smash up our places. And I was like, yeah, cool, man. So he... <laughs> So we said goodbye to him, you know, and this all like mixed up, like the white guys were the ones who helped organize the rally. The black dude is sitting back here with the gun, worried about the looters. Like if you told this story to a leftist, they'd be like, no, this doesn't exist like this. You know what I mean? It's like not inside of their, like, how would this shake down? It's like, oh no, man. Like same thing as you said, a lot of poor black people in the neighborhoods, their primary concern. I mean, like I told you, we're a city of 30,000 people. You got two, three people getting shot and killed every week here this summer twice as many shootings this year as there were last year up to this point. You know, people's primary concern is dealing with the violence in the streets. And, you know, you look totally out of touch and you just look like an asshole if you don't address that. Or if you go bypass that and only say, 
hey, we just got to abolish the police and everything will be good. I mean, like all of the people we know from the streets, people who've done time, uh, they were just, you know, my dad right away was just like burning buildings. His first thing was, I might have told you this when we talked on the phone, but my dad's first thing was, he's like, Vinny, he's like, do you know how many of these buildings were insurance jobs? He goes, you think these protesters burned down all these joints? He goes, if, he goes do you know what we were doing back in the 67 and 68 riots in Chicago? He goes, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> now, there's no statute on limitations for arson, so it's not like he participated in any of that. But in any case, you know, it's like, yeah, this is the kind of like thought. When you're from the streets, I, was, I just wrote down a few things. You said order, rules, all of that exists in any – I well, actually, this will allow you to kind of go into an area that I don't know nearly as much about. And I think this is like this whole – Oh, I wanted to make one point about retaliatory violence because I think your point about that situation in what is now known as Louisiana is an interesting point and something for everybody to keep in mind on the left. You know, talk to people in street gangs, talk to people who have been involved in organized crime. When somebody kills one person, another person comes back and kills two people. Then they torture your relative. Then they kill your sister. I mean, this can go on and on until you, you know, you can get locked into a cycle of violence that... I don't think any of us want to be locked into because it takes away everybody's humanity and it makes everybody act like just the most violent, vile creatures that we can possibly be. And that, you know, I think anything we could do to avoid that is good. Um, well, this, 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 I just want to say this really quickly that that as much as I don't like the notion of a state having a monopoly on violence, I mean, I've got real problems with that on some levels. Um, that doesn't alter the fact that you can understand how the bureaucratization or the depersonalization of justice, you can understand how that becomes a really important thing or a big thing because it doesn't lead to the Hatfields and McCoys. It doesn't lead to blood feuds. I mean, it's so funny. You know, you have your, your, I mean, I've lived in the West most of my life and, um, an Indian said to me a while ago, they were just laughing about how nasty white politics is because they said, you think Indi white politics is nasty. Indian politics is like, is just as nasty, except it also goes back to your great grandfather stole my great grandfather's horse. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get pissed off at you about that too. So you got these feuds sometimes that last for generations too. Yeah. Um, yeah. it's, and, and my point here is that, <clears throat> There is an argument to be made for the depersonalization of that law enforcement yeah. to prevent those sorts of personalized feuds. Yeah, that's a good point. That's I, a really interesting I'm not point. I'm not sure that I always want to make that argument, but it's it certainly is a valid argument. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, that makes a lot of sense. I have never heard somebody put it that way. But no, that was it. I was just thinking... Um, yeah, hierarchy, orders, rule, order, rules. I think for you, this extends to all kinds. Now, we might want to separate this into a separate conversation because I know we're already going over an hour. But, I, but what I wanted to also talk to you about was like really get into the whole cancel culture shit, the deplatforming shit, how this is connected to like things that you've said about uh, uh, queer theory, transgender, all kinds of different shit. Like I think that stuff... This is, again, I think, stuff that we're going to have to talk about. And I think that one of the things that... The way that I understand it, when you... Par, par, tell me if I'm wrong. Part of when you're talking about rules and, and, and that, like, the truth is the truth and this is, this is what it is, like, you can't just say that this doesn't exist when this exists, that... This extends to the way we look at the, the way we interact with the living world, um, patriarchy, the way we treat and view women in this society, um, all, on down the list. Like all the, all the, like f the way that I understand it or the way that I've read your, your work over the years is that this is, this isn't just something that's, happening within this space of organizing or trying to get this done or that done or in these human interactions or politics as it is, but that this extends and goes in so deeply and broadly that it really impacts how we 
uh, interact with the whole world and how we're seeing the world. Does that make sense the way that I'm saying that? Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's a, a few huge questions in there and, and I want to come back, remind me in case I forget to, that I want to talk about, I want to do a whole nother interview about cancel culture, but I want to say something about it in a minute. Okay. But before then I, I want to, um, I guess one of the things that's, that's important to me is that I think, okay, have you read, and it's okay if you haven't, have you read Martin Buber's I and Thou? Mm -mm. Okay. Do you know about it? Nope. Okay. Really interesting book. Very important to me in my twenties and thirties that his, his basic, it's basically a, a work of theology slash philosophy. And his basic idea is that there are two sorts of relationships. There's I, you, where I'm me and you are you, and there's I, it, where I am me and you are an object for me to, to exploit. And it's really nice to talk about how we really want to be in relationships of I, you, but as Martin Buber made clear in that book, you can't be I, you all the time because if I go to the grocery store, I can't perceive every single person in the grocery store as an individual at every moment or existentially, I just freeze up. You know, it's just too much information. The world is too complex. And then when you extend that to non-humans, you know, the mosquito that's buzzing around, the plant over there, you can't perceive everybody as an individual always. But having said that, I, it is really the world of exploitation. And it's, and that's how we perceive others as that's how we exploit others is by perceiving ourselves as a subjective being and perceiving the hated other as an object. And that would be true if you're a racist, uh, if, uh, if you perceive black people as inferior or monolithic, um, it would be true with women. It would be true with cops. If you perceive the cops as monolithic and not as individuals who have their own lives and their own motivations, um, then, I mean, that's fundamental, fundamental to war is to dehumanize the, the, the enemy. And again, I'm not suggesting that at every moment, every United States soldier had to perceive every German soldier as an individual. I mean, for one thing, you can't. You can't even perceive all your friends as individuals all the time. I mean, you can't at every moment, even though you have this relationship with Sergio, you can't at every moment be going. I mean, there are times when it's like Sergio is an object to, can, can you please pass the butter? You know, you don't have to get into <laughs> his psychology to, ha to ask him to, to pass the butter. And so what I'm getting at is that part of our problem ecologically is that we perceive everybody who isn't human as being objects to be exploited. We don't consider that trees have lives as valuable to them as mine is to me and yours is to you. And um, there is currently, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll take the camera down and show you this before we turn off, there is currently a bear banging on the window. And that's, I mean, I live on their land. It's not that they live on my land. We, we're, we live on each other's land. And um, I told Max that that would scare the hell out of me. And he was like, oh, man, he's like, you got to get out here. He's like, I got, he's like, I just, I need, I need to like immerse myself in like a month long, like him just being like, hey, look, this is what it's like to be out here and you're not in the city anymore. And this is what it's all about. Cause he told me a similar thing. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that shows you how obviously, de like, I know in my mind what you're saying in that way is very correct. But I know also through my personal experiences, because I have no exposure, that it's like, it still scares me. I hope that makes sense. So, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I have a great example of that. When I was 17, I went to this summer science training program at the University of Southern California, 33 nerds from across the country. Um, <laughs> and it was great. It was, uh, 
it was exactly what you would expect from 33 nerds who were all away from their parents for the first time. Um, by which I mean, uh, we were nerds, so there was lots of explosives as well as everything else. <laughs> and we were 17. I mean, how stupid. Anyway, um, so at one point we went on a camping trip and I grew up in the country and I'm like, I, I was laughing so hard at my roommate and everybody else who were making plans for what to do when coyotes attack. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. It's, and they were scared of coyotes and I like didn't give it a second thought. Meanwhile, they, a lot of them were from California and we went, when we went to the ocean, they're like having a great time. And I had seen Jaws a couple years before, and I'm terrified because it's like I didn't grow up with it. I didn't know anything about this. And then one more story about that is, oh, God, 15, 18 years ago, I was on tour, and I went to – I did a talk at this sort of farm – this this farm school. And it was so interesting because after, after I did the talk, then they took me around the farm, and – we get out with the cows, and I grew up around cows, and we get with the cows. They're in a barn, and I'm like just walking in between all the cows, pushing them out of the way, and it's, it's no big deal. It's just they're cows. And then we got over to the pigs, the pasture of the pigs, and they, we threw some watermelon in, and they were crushing the watermelon with their jaws, and I did not grow up around pigs. And they said, hey, you want to go pet them? It's like, I'm not getting in that pen. They just crushed a <laughs> watermelon with their jaws. They're going to kill me. It's like the only way they'll kill you is by crawling on your lap and squishing you. They're friendly. It's like I'm not getting in there. Yeah, yeah. And the point is cows I grew up with, I know. Pff, pigs I did not. It scared the hell out of me. Same. I grew up around coyotes. No big deal. I go to the ocean and I'm scared I'm going to get bitten by crabs and <laughs> eaten by sharks. And it's like. <laughs> And everybody's like, Derek, you'll be lucky if you see any fish at all. <laughs> so anyway, I completely, completely am with you on that. Anyway, I, I want to say something about cancel culture, which is we, we, we interacted about this the other day, that there are a lot of people who say, well, yes, you can say whatever you want, but there's going to be consequences. And yes, I agree there should be consequences, but the consequences should be that you don't talk to me again or that you don't uh, buy my books right. or that the consequences should not be that I lose my job. Right. The consequences should not be that you threaten to kill me. <clears throat> and Jonah Mix had a great comment about this. He said, let's put this in any other circumstance, any other right except for speech and see how it sounds. Yeah, you can sit down at that counter, you say to a black person, but there's going to be consequences. Right. That's outrageous. Yep. Um, you know, you, woman, you can go without your burqa, but there will be consequences. And it's like it would never I mean, there are there are people who have been published by some of my former publishers whose work I find odious. And it never occurred to me to try to get them depublished. It never occurred to me oh. to try to it's like, or to, to write to them at their home. It's, it never occurred to me to send them a death threat. It's just, I'm not going to read their books again. Or here's a great example is I have no problem. You know, Chaz, do you know where the term autonomous zone comes from? It comes no, I don't. from Hakeem Bey uh, and his book, Temporary Autonomous Zones. Hakeem Bey is an open pedophile and temporary autonomous zones has a bunch of pedophilia in there where he's arguing like he has fantasies about the parents of children dying and then them having to rely on him. And he has a poem called My Politics. It's called My Politics. And the poem is about raping a child in a bathtub. And so here's the point. I don't have a problem with me saying, wow, I find it troubling that the Chaz, that the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone was named after a term that was brought up by, that was created by a pedophile. And um, I recognize fully that that's ad hominem. And that said, do I think that Hakeem Bey should have his books removed from bookstores? No. If I had a bookstore, I wouldn't carry them. 
But I have never gone to a bookstore and said, you need to stop carrying Hakeem Bay. Sure. It's, 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 I, okay. I interviewed George Gerbner many, many years ago. George Gerbner was the TV violence guy. He had done studies since the fifties about, about the amount of violence on TV, which by the way, he didn't think caused violence. What he thought TV violence did was it made people have what he called a mean world syndrome which is you think people are a lot worse than they actually are because a lot of us can go our entire lives and never see a murder. Right. But on TV, people are murdering each other all the time. So you get to think that people are worse than they actually are. And his other deal was something called casting and fate, which is in a movie, a guy, and this has just changed some, but a man can kill with impunity. And if a woman kills, then the whole movie has to be about how she could do something so awful. And so Bruce Willis kills 15 people in the first five minutes. And it's like, well, no big deal. And so he pointed out, he was studying who did what to whom. Anyway, the point on all this is that Gerbner was a media expert studying it for 50 years. And by the way, he had been a resistance fighter in World War II. So he's, he's, his anti-Nazi cred is about as high as you can get. <laughs> and he himself argued he did not think that neo-Nazis should not be allowed a voice. He thought that Nazis and neo-Nazis should be allowed to say whatever they want, and then you rebut it. And he said that his solution to any problems in, in this sort of speech is open discussion, honest debate, and if somebody says, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to say something else about this too. I know we're way over time. No, but, that's okay. Um, we don't have a time limit. I just didn't want to bother you too much. Well, no, it's great to talk with you. And I want to talk about this another time more extensively. And I'm going to have to go in a few minutes. But I want to say something else, too, which is, did you did we talk before about the, the brouhaha when I, without, without really knowing what was going on, I got interviewed by a, a white nationalist? We talked about this privately, yeah. Yeah. So... One of the things I want to mention, okay, so I didn't know, and I say yes to almost every interview. I've only said no to a half dozen interviews ever. Um, and usually that's been personal reasons. Like if the person's been a jerk to me before, they do one interview and they're asshole. So, I, so if they ask again, I say no. Yeah. But in general, I say yes because that's my job. And also because so many people have said yes to me that I want to pay that forward. You know, when I was young, for God's sake, I was nobody. And Robert J. Lifton gave me an interview. I was like, why did he do that? You know, that yep. was that was so nice of him. And I'm going to do the same. Anyway, yep. point is, this guy asked, asked for an interview. And then he sends me questions, which I answer. And I didn't know he's a white nationalist. And when he put it on the website, he said, Derek does, probably doesn't agree with anything on the website. And nonetheless, we feel his views are important. And my point is that his interview was actually really good, and my answers were, were very good. And the reason I bring, want to bring it up now <clears throat> is because one of his questions was, as global warming continues, there will be a lot more refugees. And so do you want to talk about immigration and refugee movement? And I said, okay, sure. And I'm going to piss off both the left and the right with this. The way I'm going to piss off the right is by saying a lot of these people are moving because of capitalism, because their own, uh, they're not moving up from El Salvador because they want to take an eco tour of the San Joaquin Valley. They're coming up because their community has been destroyed and they need to make a living for their fan to send down to their family. This is, this is capitalism and colonialism at work is why it happens. So that's going to piss off the right when I blame the center of empire for refugees moving in. And I'm going to, the left is going to get pissed off at me because I'm also going to say that if you have a community and through no specific fault of their own, there's an influx of outsiders um, who move in, perhaps change community values, have different values, um, we all think that's uncomfortable, that 
you know, I live in a neighborhood, and when there's a new person, when I moved into this neighborhood, the neighbors, a few of them told me, God, we were all nervous when you moved in that you were going to, like, mess up the neighborhood, and then we met you, and you're okay, and everything's fine. But when a new person moves in, you're always nervous that they could change things for the worse, sure. just generically. And so I don't blame people who have a large, especially if a large number of people move in, I don't blame the people for feeling some resentment. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring all of this up right now is because, in terms of George Gerbner, is because I, and this has to do with everything we've been talking about today, I don't think it does any good to simply say that somebody who feels uncomfortable when somebody new moves into their community, or when a lot of new people move into their community, I don't think it does any good to say, oh, fucking racist, fuck them. Mm -hmm. I think that what we need to do is to talk about that perspective, talk about the perspective of the people moving in, talk about the perspective of how this changes the local society, how it doesn't change the local society, how it can improve or harm the local society. I, I'm a big fan of discourse that way. And it's like, I don't think it helps to pretend that, and yes, we can find some of these perspectives odious, and we can hate some of these perspectives, but that doesn't mean that people don't feel them. And that doesn't make, the fact that they feel them does not make them okay. The fact that we don't like them does not make them not okay. Mm -hmm. I think that when you have people in conflict, it's like Jeanette Armstrong, the Okanagan Indian, and maybe this would be a good thing to end on for today. Jeanette Armstrong, the Okanagan writer and activist, uh, talks about how she said, you know, we Indians have the same squabbles that white people do. We, you know, dislike each other. We have fights. And the difference is that I understand, since we live in place, we understand that my great-grandchildren might marry your great-grandchildren, so we have to figure out ways to get along. And one of the things that the Okanagans have done is to create a conflict resolution method that they call Anaukan, that they actively want to export to the world. And Anaukan means, I challenge you to give me most opposite I challenge you to give me your most opposite perspective to mine so I can increase my understanding. And that's what they use for conflict resolution, or one of the things they use. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to listen to every single thing, because she told me they have trained facilitators who, if somebody's just bringing up the same old shit again, it's like, we've heard that. Shut up. You know? Or, or, and she also said that you can only do it when people are invested in the community and when they don't want what you have. So they have a difficult time doing it with some of the white community because if white people want their land and they don't want them to take their land, that's not something you can resolve through an outcome process. But if, if, if I'm pissed off at you because, you know, three weeks ago you did this terrible thing to me and we need to figure out how to get along. Or a great example is the one you gave that you're going to have a protest and you're going to participate in a protest, and your neighbor wants to protect the store, well, so how do you bring those two together? And you did, obviously, without any an outcome process, but you didn't need it. But in some circumstances, you might need it. So my point is that, coming back to the beginning of everything, my whole big deal is I just think we need more discourse, not less. And we need to be honest about what we want. And there, this is something, I, I, I don't want to get into this today because we're running out of time, but I mean, what, what do we actually want? And how do we, how do we, and as you always say, how do we organize to get it? Well, what we want, um, yeah. Well, that's, 
it's a good way to end, but it's also a terrible way to end because now I'm like, fuck, I'm be sitting around with Sergio talking about what do we want all day. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, one thing that I've – here's my promise to everyone. I promise every single person that I will be as honest as I possibly can about what I'm thinking, which means as someone who's – like I see myself as like a lifelong student um, – as someone who skipped 12 years of school. So I got a lot of making up to do, (laughs) um, you know, and uh, it's like, and then even being involved with the movement, I mean, or movements. Um, one of the reasons I like doing the show is because it allows me to pick people's brains, which allows me to think more, ask more questions, bounce those ideas off, you know, folks like Sergio and vice versa. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think one of my challenges has been trying to figure out what is that vision? You know, what is it exactly? Maybe we don't know exactly. Um, but it dictates what you do. I mean, that's the tough part. I mean, if you don't have a clear idea of the vision, um, which should dictate your strategy, which should then dictate your tactics and all the rest, um, but yeah, all I can do is be honest with people that I'm very torn between a lot of things. I mean, I'm very torn because I've seen enough of the violence, human violence on other humans that, and I'm not a pacifist, but I, yeah, I worry. I mean, I, It's a difficult, it's a difficult, uh, in other words, how do I put this? I balance your work up with virtually every other person's work that I come up with or that I encounter or that I read. So like Sergio and I will be reading a book from some Marxist in France or from some labor union person in the Philippines or whatever it may be. And we're like, okay, yes, yes, yes. How does it in some ways, how does it relate to the living world? is it timely? Like does, is there a sense of like, this has to happen? It has to happen now because if there's not that sense of urgency, then I think you're really off base no matter what you're doing. I cut people a lot of slack who have a sense of urgency um, or who understand that the situation is totally critical and that we need to be acting and doing, you know? And so yes, as much talking as possible, but all of that talking in the aim of, of hopefully doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think I've told you in this in the past, but <clears throat> it's no bullshit. I mean, everything that we end up encountering, because there's so many different perspectives on the left, I like hearing from different people on the left who I think are doing interesting work, people who have been kind to me, people who are, you know, all the rest. The same as you said, like it, paying it forward, trying to promote people's work who are good people who I might not agree with everything that they're saying, but that doesn't matter. I mean, that's kind of the whole point is that we're not going to find a bunch of people who agree with every single thing that we say (laughs) and that's okay. And it actually makes for more lively discourse and makes for better friendships in my opinion. Um, as long as the principles aren't too far off base, but yeah, we balance a lot of it up. I do at least, I mean, maybe I'm speaking too much for Sergio. Um, I let him speak for himself, but I know I do. I mean, everything that since I've come into contact with your work in, what, 2010 and then started interviewing you, we brought you out to Chesterton for those events. Yeah, I mean, I run into something and I'm like, okay, what's their view of the living world? How do they incorporate all of this ecological knowledge that I think you and and the cats that with DGR do, so Lier, Max, all the rest, do so well? Um, I don't know, trying to find a way to synthesize some of that to the extent that it can be. I mean, the difficulty I have with all the Marxist shit is that it's always about more production, more building shit, more doing this. So like trying to find ways for those things to come together while at the same time respecting the Marxists and the socialists because they're some of the few groups that actually have collectively organized institutions. You know, I, but then I know anarchists who do believe that the earth should come first or that the living world should come first or as equally as with human needs, but then who also are into like just the politics of violation just for the fuck of it, just to break rules, fuck everybody, fuck everything. Uh, You know, (laughs) there's a a million contradictions with everything that I encounter. So it's like trying to bring all those things together, stay away from the horizontal hostility while also remaining critical. 
you know, understanding that sometimes we want big movements, try and bring in masses of people, ordinary people, but sometimes you got to speed things up and you got to do stuff without having everybody's support. I mean, all of those contradictions, all of those challenges are like pretty much the daily, you know, the daily grind conversations that we're having. And so I, all I can say is thanks to you or no thanks to you, because now <laughs> my brain is shot for whatever I encounter. I'm always like, what is, what would Derek say about this? It's like, no, it's a real thing. I mean, and that's because you bring such a unique perspective. And for that, I think there's a reason why people are interested in what you say. And I, you know, it's a very, it's, it might not be unique because you pull in the way that you pull from so many other people, I think is also unique. You know, you're one of, you're, you're like constantly referencing friends, other people's work, but you're pulling all of this knowledge in. Um, anyway, that's a rambling way to end a, a good podcast. <laughs> that was supposed to well, be an thanks. interview of you and I'm just like, not shut the fuck up. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for all of this. I look forward to doing it again. Let's do one on cancel culture. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I would love to do one on cancel culture. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host, Vince Emanuele, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C-Media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics Art Roots Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.